All right, if you would, go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 this morning. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Let's pray. Father God, you are holy. And it is a joy to be able to study your word this morning. I pray that your word will sink deep into our hearts and our lives. And Father, as I am preaching through this series on perseverance how to live a godly life in a fallen world, I pray that we will respond to the word of God and live this life that brings you honor and glory. So use me, and I pray the Holy Spirit will speak through me and that we will find that we have a huge reason that you have created us. And we have purpose and meaning in this life, and it is to bring you glory, and that's what I pray that we do. And I pray that people, and me included, that we will be reminded of these truths, and these truths will be displayed in our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're going to see through the next, I don't know, 10 weeks or whatever, or of this study, 10 or 11 weeks of this study, every week will build on top of one another. And so every week I'll remind you of a truth that I preached on. Some weeks we'll have one or two truths. Some weeks we'll have only one. Some weeks may have three. Um, It's just truth after truth that Peter is building on top uh, as he writes writes this letter inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so let's look back at verse 1, and we're going to walk through this. Every week be reminded of these truths um, that I have been talking to you about. Remember that Peter is writing to persecuted believers Believers who he is spurring on, encouraging uh, to live and to persevere amid suffering, amid persecution. He is telling them, hey, we want you to, I want you to be reminded of these truths. I want you to rest in these truths. And then I want you to go out and do great things, even though you're facing persecution, even though it's amid suffering in your life. And that's the same thing I'm trying to remind you of this morning. That you can persevere, you can live a godly life amid a hard, broken, and dark, and hopeless world. You can persevere because of Christ. And so let's look at verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles. To those that are elect exiles in dispersion. Verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with his blood. And so what Peter is telling these believers who are being persecuted, who are in dispersion, he's saying you can persevere because you are God's. And that was the first truth that we looked at a couple weeks ago. Persevere by knowing they are God's. They are his elect according to his foreknowledge. They are sanctified and sealed with the Holy Spirit. They are transformed by the Holy Spirit. And they are members of the new covenant. So he's encouraging them. Same thing that I'm encouraging you. You can live a godly life in this fallen and broken and hopeless world because you are God's if you have repented and followed Jesus. You are his. That was the first truth we looked at. The second truth that we looked at that Peter's reminding them. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy. Okay, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Peter is telling those persecuted believers they can persevere by knowing where their hope lies. Their hope does not lie in anything temporal. Okay? Their hope lies in Christ in a living hope which is eternity means they are eternally secure in the hand of God that is where their hope lies so whatever this world throws at them they are gods and they have a living hope that can never be taken from them it's the same thing that I'm telling you even though this world is hard and even though it is broken and even though though it is dark you can persevere you can live a godly life because you are gods 
You are His. And you have a hope that can never be taken from you. No one can take that from you. Death cannot take that from you. Persecution cannot take that from you. Satan cannot take that from you. Sin, even, cannot take that from you. You're God's. You're eternally secure. Number three, we looked at last week, verse four, this living hope, this eternal security in heaven with God. He describes it here in verse four, to an, etern- or sorry, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So number three, followers persevere because they have an eternal inheritance that will never pass away. So they persevere because they know their gods. They persevere because they have a living hope. They're eternally secure in the hands of God. And they persevere because that inheritance never goes away. It never goes away, ever. It never decays. It never fades. There is no corruption. There is no pollution. It's there forever, kept and guarded by God. Because of those things, church family, I want to be clear on this. I don't know that I was clear last week as I needed to be. Because of those things, because we are gods, because we have a living hope, because our living hope will never pass away, we can rejoice when troubles come. We can rejoice. Because they're temporal. They only last for a little while. They serve a purpose. So when they come and you are resting in the truths of God, you are resting in that you are His, you're resting in that you have a living hope that will never pass away, that is evidence that you are truly putting all your chips in that you're following Jesus. That is show, showing that you are a genuine believer. And this is where Peter has, has brought the people who are being persecuted. Could you imagine the encouragement that they felt? That's the same place I've been bringing you. That you can rest in these truths, and by resting in these truths, you can persevere and live a life for the glory of God. But it only comes through resting in these truths. So when struggles come, when brokenness comes, when sickness comes, when trials come, you can get through it. You know why? Because you have a hope that will never pass away. Guarded and kept in heaven by God who redeemed you and caused you to be born again through Jesus. It's amazing truth, is it not? So that not, those truths not only bring us hope, they also bring us purpose. They not only give us hope, but they also give us purpose. That we, as followers of Christ, who have repented of our sins and trust Jesus as Lord, we've surrendered our life to Jesus. We have hope and we have purpose. And not a temporal purpose, but an eternal purpose. Okay, so followers of Christ persevere with eternal purpose. Look at verse... 13. Therefore, therefore, all these truths, what's therefore, therefore? Therefore, all of this culminating together, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what therefore is there for. That we have a purpose. We have a calling that we are to commit our lives to. So what we see here. If you look at verse 13, it says, preparing your minds. Preparing your minds. This means to, um, this means to, in ancient ancient times, this means that somebody would gather one's robe when they needed to be in a hurry. And I, I want to be very clear in painting this illustration. 
that this word therefore preparing your minds for action is showing an illustration of someone that was gathering up needing to run or go somewhere in a hurry. And this means that it would, they would pull in the loose ends of their clothing so they could, they could run. This is what Peter's trying to say. He wants us to pull in the loose endings, the hindrances of this world, and he wants us to run toward God's glory, run toward an eternal purpose that he has for us. And it's why this therefore is here. It means in light of his return, he has left us here with a purpose. Even though we will face troubles and trials, we have work to do. And so he is saying, pull in these loose hindrances, pull in these distractions, and run your race. He's saying you can rest in the fact that you are God. You can rest in the fact that you have an eternal living hope. You can rest that that hope will never pass away. And in your resting, now bring in your mind, get rid of those hindrances, Tie up the loose ends and run on. Run your race because Jesus is worthy of that. And that's what he's called us to. And so he doesn't just leave the people who are being persecuted to rest in God's truth. He leaves them to rest in God's truth with purpose. That even though you're being persecuted, I want you to continue to run your race. I want you to continue to face that persecution because God's worthy of it. So I don't want you to be distracted. I want you to clear the fog. Clear the fog. Get rid of all this, 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 and this, and focus your life on what really matters. That's what he's telling them, and that's what we need to grab hold of this morning. You say, why is that, Pastor? We live in a world that is smaller today than it's ever been before. We live in a world that is smaller today than it's ever been before. You say, How do you, why, why do you say that, Pastor? What, what makes you say that? If you want to grab out your smartphone right now and you want to look at the Rockies, you can do it. Actually, we have service in here now and Wi-Fi. And you can pull that up. I was laying in bed with Elijah and we were talking about fishing and he loves fishing. And I was telling him about trout fishing. He's four and we've never been trout fishing because we don't live right in Boone, North Carolina anymore. And he was like, what's a trout, Dad? Guess what I did? I pulled it up on Google. And I showed him a trout. And then I showed him a trout stream. And we just kind of had this moment where we just were there, you know? The world's smaller now than it's ever been before. We are more connected now than we've ever been before. You're more connected. We are the most connected generation ever. You say, what, what do you mean by that? I live four hours from my parents. When Julia learns to walk and my mom and dad's not here, guess what I'm going to do? I'm on FaceTime. And they're going to share in the milestones of my children's life. We're the most connected. You know who else I can share, Julia, when she learns to walk? You know who else I can share that with? Anybody I want to, half a country, half, you know, half the world away. If there's a group in Kenya, I can FaceTime. Say, hey, look, here's Julia walking. When I was in Kenya, we made a video about 30 minutes before the church service started. Donald made that, sent it here, and showed it to you guys when we were first in Kenya. We are more connected than we've ever been. This world is smaller than it's ever been. We can jump in a car and drive about anywhere we want to go. If that car won't get us there, a car will get us to an airport where a plane will fly us to anywhere we want to go. And if that can't happen, we will drive and get on a ship that goes to about anywhere we want to go. And if that doesn't work, and it's an unreached people group, we can get on a ship that will take us to a helicopter that will land in a field. We can go anywhere we want to go. So we are the most connected. We can go anywhere we want to go. And you see this on social media. Not only are we most connected, they can go anywhere we want to go, but we can share it with everybody we want to. Now, I have people tell me all the time, Jeremy, I wish you would post more. I want to see what's going on in your family. I'm like, I'm too busy to do that. They're running everywhere. Right? But people want to know. They want to share in all that is going on in your life. And that's the country. That's the world that we live in right now. And apart from something crazy happening, that's not going to change. If you go on your social media accounts, I can tell you your family vacation. 
Sadly, you can, you can see everything about your home and where your kids sleep and be careful with that, okay? Like, we share everything. It's all on there. And so we are the most connected, we enjoy the most experiences, we can go anywhere we want to go, and with all that being said, we are the most anxious and depressed generation in history. With all of that, go anywhere we want to go, experience whatever we want to experience, be connected to whoever we want to be connected to, we are the most depressed and anxious generation in history. If all of this is living, being connected, going anywhere we want to go, making the world smaller, talking to whoever we want to talk to, sharing in whatever experience we want to share in, if that is living, and that is fulfilling, and that is satisfying, why are we more depressed, lonely, and anxious than ever before? It's a true question, right? I read study after study this week. They continued to show this to be true. We have more likes on Facebook. We have more friends than we've ever had. So why are we so lonely? Why are we so hopeless? Why are we so broken? Why are we so depressed? Now hear me. Family vacation is not a bad thing. Fun experiences are not bad. Being connected is not bad. But that can't be what we live for. It can't be. My fear is that, that what, that's what we define as living. And so we're looking to live a life where people can just see all the experiences we get to enjoy and like our Facebook so we get a good feeling in ourselves for about 15 minutes when we have 200, 300 likes. And we call that living church it's not that's not living people are working their whole life and devoting their whole life to another experience not those experiences are bad but church that's not our purpose that's not what we're created to do it's why when you do something besides what you're created to do at the end of the day it's a temporal satisfaction that leaves you hopeless broken and wanting more. And that's the reality. And so what Peter is doing right here is he's reminding those persecuted believers. He's like, hey, I know that you are facing this and this and this trial and this distraction, but I want you to realize that you have a purpose in this life. And I want you to clear the fog, clear your mind, and run your race well. And that's the same thing that I want for you. I'm not telling you you can't have family vacations. I'm not telling you you can't enjoy experiences. I'm just telling you that's not what you devote your life to. It's not what you devote your life to. So again, this is what he's saying in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. What in your life is hindering you? What's in your life, what in your life is hindering you? From living for eternal significance and eternal purpose. What is it? Is it your dreams? What is it? Is it temporal satisfaction? What are you you living for? What's hindering you from living for God or devoting your life to God? What is it? Is it fear? What are you chasing? Some people say, well, well, time. I would live for God more if I had more time. You're giving your time to something. What are you giving it to? Well, I'm working. Well, what's the purpose for your work? To build up my 401k. Well, good. And when you get that built up and you do retire, then what? Then what? What then? Is it for God's glory? Is it to run your race well? What is it? Because what you're devoting your time to, it will either leave you with joy because it's for an eternal significance, or it'll leave you empty. 
You'll be chasing a never-ending dream that will never fulfill you. And that's the reality. So what would you give your time to? What are you working toward? What's your marriage trying to accomplish? What are you teaching your kids? Really matters what they should devote their life to. Set your minds. Prepare your minds for action. Look through the temporal satisfactions and see the real treasure is Jesus and his work. Look through the temporal distractions. Look through the various trials. Look through the hardness of living in this world. Look through the American dream. Look through it all and see that Jesus is the real treasure and Jesus is who you should devote your life to. It's him. This is what Peter is telling Christians, to be focused and ready to move. He is saying you were created to do work for the glory of God. You are his. You have a living hope that cannot be taken away from you. They can burn you at the stake and you will die and enjoy eternal life forever. So march on. Live for the glory of God. Stay focused. He's saying persecution is distracting. Trials sometimes distract. This world seeks to distract distract you. So I want you to clear the fog. I want you to clear your mind. And I want you to focus on what's really important. It's Jesus and his work. Jesus and his work. And so again, I want to say, guys, experiences and vacations and travels and all that, man, thank the Lord we live in the air we live in. That's great. That can't be what you devote your life to. That can't be what brings you purpose. It can't be. That is temporal satisfactions that leave you chasing a world that will leave you hopeless. Leave you hopeless. I think I got this lesson taught to me when I was in college. I don't think, I know. And it was a family that we were real close to, um, and they had seven children. And some of their children's names are my children's names. I know you're thinking, man, they meant that much to you that you named your kids after them. Kind of. I also started running out of biblical names that I liked. Just to be honest. Right, but when you always name your kids, you kind of see somebody that's named that, right? And you're like, man, that's awesome. Or, no, I'm not going to name my kid that, right? Like, are we all, to be honest there? (laughs) And so um, we named our kids, and a lot of them have the same names as, as kids in this family. His family always impressed me so much. There were seven of them. We're driving down the road, and they're very frugal with their money, and they were so happy. They were so happy, and they were so close as a family, and there were seven of them, and they were crazy athletic, and they just competed against each other with humility, and it was shocking to me. You know, competition with humility. What is that, right? Especially when I'm 20. And I'm talking to them, and I'm like, hey, man, so what y'all do for, like, family vacation? Where y'all going this summer? And over and over again, they just said, man, we're going camping in the backyard. Or, and, we're, you know, we're, we're just going down to the lake, you know, the river right down by our house. They just hand me down clothes, and they, they just lived this content and simple life, but they were the most happy, joy-filled Christians who committed their life. I remember waking up early in the morning to go to class, and... I saw one of them named Elijah uh, coming back from going to his devotion, his private time at 7 in the morning. He was coming back to go to class at 8. They were happy, and they had a purpose, and they led people to the Lord, and they enjoyed time together, and they went to the backyard, and they played football and volleyball and basketball and baseball and hockey, and all their cousins would come in, and it was like the Harris family, right? And it was just all of them come in. And they just pile in there, and they would play soccer against each other. And I thought to myself, man, I hope I have that one day. A family that loves Jesus and have set their hearts and their minds prepared to run a race for the glory of God. And cousins and everybody just comes in, and they just love one another and spur one another on for good works. And that's a legacy. That's a legacy. And I learned that because I saw this family that committed their life. So many times they taught me lesson after lesson after lesson. And they just enjoyed We went hiking together, and they just lived. 
and never was distracted from what really mattered, which was God. Ever. I'll never forget, we were watching a Super Bowl, and a halftime show popped up, and these girls jumped up and dancing and wearing what they should not wear. And I'll never forget the other one named Jeremiah, which if, if we'd have had another son, that was what his name was going to be. <laughs> so it's kind of a weird thing. Um, but I'll never forget Jeremiah. He looked at me, and he goes, I'd be so embarrassed and so broken if that was my daughter. Like, forget the entertainment of it. Like, of people singing in a halftime show. He had this really brokenness about him. He turned to me on the couch, and he goes, I'd be so embarrassed and so broken if that was my daughter. Like, I'm talking like almost tears in his eyes. Clear the fog. They're running their race. Man, this, this other thing's not going to distract me. I'm not chasing after these other things. I'm living for the Lord. In my study, I was studying the sermon, and we had talked about it over as a staff, and Brother Danny had talked about sojourners on the move, and I guess he had preached a sermon like this before, and it was just really good, and I got reminded of um, Charles Spurgeon's autobiography. And in his autobiography, it said that his great-grandfather was persecuted for being a Christian. His great-grandfather was persecuted for being a Christian. And as he was in his jail cell, they said that you could hear him pray over and over and over that he, and, and I can pull it up here because I want to make sure I read this correctly, said that he would pray that his children to the last generation will live for God. As he would pray and pray that his children to the last generation would live for God. It was the great grandfather of Charles Spurgeon. And I think, man, what a prayer God answered. What a prayer. And then I got to thinking, I actually told Keith this. I was like, I wonder who was the first in Keith's family to follow the Lord. Like, I wonder. I wonder who was the first to follow the Lord that passed down truths to him that he has now passed down to his girls and that he will pass down one day to his grandkids and then their grandkids will pass down truths that Keith was taught from somebody in his family that lived for the Lord to their grandkids. You see, it just trickled down. People who were focused on what really matters and they passed Jesus from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next because they have prepared their minds for action. They have something to do and that is to bring glory to God and lead their families to bring glory to God. And you see this legacy of faith that's with Keith's family, don't you? This legacy of faith they're passing down. You see that in Spurgeon with great-grandfather and him. I wonder what's distracting us from doing this. What's distracting us? Vacations, dreams, money, retirement, trials. What's distracting us? We are a part of something special, a legacy of faith, workmen for the glory of God. And so I want us to grab hold of our priorities, to grab hold of our mind, and to live with an eternal Purpose. See, what is this eternal purpose? To treasure Jesus. To help others and tell them about Jesus. To pass Jesus down from generation to generation to generation. To sell out our life for the glory of God. To help out orphans and widows in their distress. Like, to totally commit. So let's look at verse 13. And I've got to start wrapping this up. Therefore, preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded. The sober-minded means steadfast or self-controlled. Fighting this world with right priorities. Okay? Steadfast, self-controlled. Set your hope fully. This word set is, in other words, in the Greek can also mean rest. Rest fully in the hope of Christ. Okay, so therefore, prepare your minds for action. Tie up these loose ends. Gather these hindrances. Be steadfast with right priorities and rest in your future hope through Christ, is what it's saying. At the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, we are the children of God. We are His, remember? We are His. We have a living hope, a living hope that can never pass away. So we need to be at work with this purpose as obedient children. 
Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. This former life of yours chased after the world. Don't conform to that. Don't conform to that. Verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Word holy means set apart. You should look different than this world because you're not chasing this world. You're chasing Jesus. You're treasuring Jesus. So you want to persevere in this fallen world? Realize that you're God's. You want to persevere in this fallen world? Realize you have a living hope. You want to persevere in this fallen world? Realize that living hope will never go away. If you want to persevere in this fallen world... You can do that, but you need to set your minds. You need to clear from the distraction, clear the fog, and set your mind on a real purpose, and it is Christ. And you can persevere because you won't be distracted. You're tying up the loose ends, and you're running your race for the glory of God. So it's time to rest in whose you are, and then go and run your race for his glory. So rest in whose you are. And realize you have a life to live. And that life will bring you joy. It will bring you peace. It will bring you hope. It will bring you an actual life. That's what it will bring you. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that we will clear the distractions in our life. I pray that we will run our race well. That we will look to you as our greatest treasure. That we will look to bringing you glory with every area and every part of our life. And so right now, Father, I pray for this congregation, my faith family. I pray that you will help them to turn and repent from anything that hinders them and distracts them from living for you. I pray, uh, God, that you will help them to um, look to your will for their life and your purpose for their life. And so, God, I pray right now that we will rest in whose we are and then go fulfill what you have for us to do in this life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.